Uh, it's Chris Brunn here. I'm um, here with Annette Franz. Hello, Annette. Hello, Chris. How are you? Sorry, I can't get on video because I'm having some technical issues. So you'll okay. just have to hear my voice. So, but welcome, everyone. Yeah, welcome, everyone. So it's a little bit unusual this in that our host, unfortunately, is having some technical difficulties. And so myself and Annette are going to host the whole session today. Uh, but it's going to be a lot of fun. We look forward to talking to an important topic here around return on investment and culture and how to measure impact and how all these pieces sort of fit together. Um, so welcome to the, the North American Customer Centricity Awards uh, webinar series. So this is part of a series that the team uh, is putting on and it's related to a, an awards program that's happening uh, in June in Dallas, Texas. Um, and uh, hopefully we would have seen some information on this, um, but it's a great opportunity to get recognition, uh, to learn from others that are trying to develop customer-centric cultures and customer-centric approaches to doing business and improving customer experience, and also to network with some of the uh, thought leaders in this space from around the world. So there's some key dates there on the screen, and I know our hosts are going to follow up with you uh, to provide more information as we go on. Um, but today's webinar is really, uh, to get to, to the topic, is really about return on investment, um, how do you measure impact, and we're going to talk about uh, the role of culture and how that, that influences um, uh, return on investment and, and, and um, some different ways of looking at this. Um, so I think probably a good place to start, Annette, is, is with this first question, you know, Really, let's take a step back and say, you know, what is company culture and, you know, how should we be thinking about return on investment, measuring impact? What are your sort of thoughts on that, uh, Annette? Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's a great place to start because I don't think everybody thinks about culture in the same way and, and uh, lots of definitions out there as well. So um, I, I, I love this def definition from Herb Kelleher, which is, you know, culture is what people do when nobody is looking. And really what that speaks to is that what people do when nobody is looking is really defined by your core values and the behaviors that align with those values. Um, I, I really think that that's real, the foundation of culture is, um, you know, culture is uh, core values plus behaviors. Um, and I think that when we think about it that way and then think about adding one other component, which we'll spend some time talking about today, which is outcomes and, you know, ultimately what we'll talk about is ROI. But if we think about what are the outcomes we look at, we're looking to achieve with those values and with those behaviors, um, I think that's how um, folks should think about uh, culture and uh, in terms of measuring the impact of culture. Um, I think that culture is also – Culture is a value driver of the business and probably one of the most important forces or parts to or drivers um, behind value creation. And I think that's a really important way to look at that as well because I think that if you've got a, a great culture, um, it's going to ultimately be seen in the company's value and the company's profitability as well. And I know we'll have some examples of that later, but um, I, I, that's sort of my – high-level, big-picture view on that question. Mm, mm, yeah, that's, that's it's great. I think Herb Keller has, uh, you know, uh, definition's a great one. I think another one that I really like is it's just the way that we do things around here. You know, it's yeah. it's just how we do business. It's just the way in which we do business. And, it, you know, it affects our yep. thinking um, in terms of and, – and and obviously the idea we're promoting is, is, is putting the customer at the centre of – how you're thinking about impact. You know, what is it that you're doing that's right. impacting customers? How are you creating value for them? How are you uh, improving their experience in a way that's meaningful to them? Um, and as a result, it's going to be meaningful to the business as well. So really, I think that's where those two pieces collide. Um, and I've actually, I've added a slide. I, I agree. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, I was just, just going to. No, 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 that's okay. I was just going to add one thing. I think I think it's important to note, too, that I believe that it's deliberately designed to be that way. You know, you mentioned customer-centric culture, and I think ultimately that's what we're talking about here. And um, mm. it's deliberately designed to be that way, right? There has to be this focus from the CEO on down to always put the customer at the center of, of everything we do in, in our discussions and our meetings and our designs and everything, right? And so I think that's mm. an important uh, thing to think about as we think about what 
you know, what culture is and, and how we're going to get those outcomes that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly right. So here's a, here's a sort of pyramid that we use to sort of describe the relationships between these things. And, you know, the foundational piece is the culture. So how are we thinking about customers? How are we thinking about, you know, the value we're delivering to them? And, we, you know, we talk about a customer-centric mindset, a way of thinking about the customers, their environment. Um, why do they do business with us? What's driving them to do business with us? How do we, you know, ensure that they stay with us and do more business with us? How, how do we ensure that, that they advocate for us um, because we're delivering great value for them? So that's sort of the foundational piece is, you know, what we call a customer culture. And then ultimately, it, if you've got that right, then you're consistently delivering this great experience and that's driving loyalty, advocacy, and ultimately that drives business performance, right? So we're thinking about you know, customer retention, customer acquisition, um, we're talking about advocacy, um, all of the, the things that customers do that actually drive business performance, how do we affect those things? Um, so that's really the sort of relationships that we see here. I think you make an interesting point there. I like that you've got in customer culture, you have noted their customer-centric processes. I read a statistic last year that said, that some research had been done and 80% of processes are, or companies develop their processes without the customer in mind, right? And so we really do have to take those values and incorporate them into the processes that we, that we and, and our policies as well. You know, does that align with the values and, and the culture that we're trying to build here? So I, I love that you guys have that called out here. Yeah, yeah, I think it's an important point, right? I think that it's often we can, build a process that that makes a lot of sense for us in terms of doing the work internally, uh, but just yep. not really thinking about what's the impact of that process on the customer and is that one that we could uh, adjust and, and make easier for the customer and, and, and also, you know, still um, efficient and, and operationally cost effective. Uh, and it's, it's kind of balancing those two things and, and not just having the internal focus, which means that we, we're doing just you know what what works for us inside inside the business, but you know not taking account of that external um, that, that customer. So that's a good point. Right. You know, in, in sort of looking at this topic here, um, I was thinking about you know what is it that, that most companies do when it comes to return you know return on investment around customer experience. And this is a card I got actually from the Peppers and Rogers Group. Um, that was a survey done to, to understand, you know, those companies that do measure uh, return on customer experience, what are they really looking at? And, and the one that stands out obviously is, is retention. And, and, you know, one of the ways to think about customer experience is we've, we've made a promise to the customer. So we've, we've got a brand, uh, we've got a sales force, and, and they've made a promise to the customer around what it's gonna be like to do business with us. And, you know, really, how do we actually deliver against that is going to be ultimately that experience that the customer has with us. And so it's a big driver of retention. I mean, if it's a bad experience, we know that customers are going to leave. If it's a good experience, we hope they're going to stay and, and do more business with us and then and then talk about us. And so the, I think this is quite a good model for thinking about those different ways of thinking about the impact of the work that you're doing around the customer experience. So, you know, there's customer acquisition, there's retention, Willingness to recommend cost cost to serve is a significant driver in some um, some industries. Um, you know how do we make it um, more cost effective for us to do business? I mean it's expensive to to process complaints. It's expensive to um, to have you know a call center there to to deal with issues that maybe could have been avoided upstream. So things like cost to serve is you know an important one. Um, links to profitability. Uh, this would come back, back to really looking at, can you measure the profitability of, of a customer? What's the value of a customer to the business? It's a little bit similar to the, the customer lifetime model. Um, but, you know, so, so a range of different metrics here. And I think that the best advice I can give around how do you, how to think about this is, is, is really identify the value of customers. You know, what is the value of customers? Think of it from that perspective to the business. And that's a good way of thinking about how do we influence that value? Can we can we encourage them to stay stay um, with us as a business for longer? You know, i.e. retention. Can we um, can we um, 
ensure that they feel like they're getting great value from us. So they're going to be open to new products um, from us. So it's a way of just thinking about um, different ways of measuring. What's been sort of your experience, Annette, with this and the, and the metrics? That sort yeah, of no, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, as I look at this list, mm -hmm. I have seen with my clients and I've heard from others that, you know, it, it is around probably more often than not, it's actually profitability that they try to tie, you know, try to tie it to, the work to, and instead they should be starting a little bit, <laughs> a little bit further back so that you can see the, see those steps and see the correlation between, you know, hey, we've, we can make the connection to retention and loyalty and customer lifetime value, and then the next step ought to be profitability. But some of them dive in and want to focus on profitability right away. The other one, the other big one that I've seen is cost to serve because I think a lot of companies start with, okay, if we're going to do this, how can we, how can we uh, save money? And especially in the call center, they'll take a look at, all right, if we, if we do this work, how will it reduce that, you know, oftentimes very expensive cost to serve, as you mentioned. And, and um, so that's, that's a, a big one there too. But those are, those are the two that I often see folks focus on is cost to serve and then right away go into profitability when I think they probably ought to start a step or two before that and ultimately then link it to uh, profitability, which is a tough one to do anyways. It's always going to be tough because there's so many variables that go into that, right? And, yeah. and, and so, yeah. but, you know, I think it, it, it is important to do, do the work, to think about what is it that I'm actually impacting with the work that I'm doing? Um, how am I actually helping um, deliver you know, what the business wants, which, you know, ultimately, you know, the way I view it is if, if we're delivering great experiences, great value to our customers, we're going to, we're going to be able to be a profitable organisation. So profit's going to yeah. follow the fact that we're delivering a, a, you know, great experience and great value to our customers. Um, but, you know, we, we need to be thinking about how we're doing that, how we're actually impacting those things and whether it's, you know, um, increasing revenues, lowering costs, um, making things easier so the customers stay with us longer. It's really connecting those, the work that you're doing to the business performance outcomes that, that the business really requires to continue to be a successful business and, and grow and compete in the marketplace. So, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, what's been your experience? You mentioned this a little bit before, but, you know, what do companies get wrong um, when quantifying the ROI of creating, a, you know, customer-centric culture, I think, and this is a challenging one yeah. too. This is a challenging one too. Yeah, and I think we talked about some of these things, but I think, I think they don't think about the, that sort of that full equation, right? Where, um, where they jump right to profitability when there are a lot of other things that they could simplify the, the calculation to begin with, you know, to get what they need. Um, but I think that they that they don't do they don't think about the the full equation and when i say that i'll just use an example so let's say you have some type of an, an improvement initiative that you want to show the roi for i think there's a lot of factors and a lot of components to actually showing that roi right so i i'd like to start with you know okay what is what is the initiative what does it entail all of that but then look at i'm, I'm gonna throw something in here that we haven't talked about yet which is look at how it impacts the employee experience for starters, right? Yep. And then how will, as it impacts the employee experience, how will that then impact the customer experience? And then how, what, what operational metrics will that impact? And then ultimately, what's the business outcome? So there's a, there's a little bit of a longer equation and a little bit of a longer way of looking at it. And, and then, so I think that's one piece. And the other piece is, yeah, just diving in, trying to take on too much when I think they need to just take on bite-sized chunks um, do you really sort of build the business case and start with smaller projects and smaller initiatives and prove the ROI of those before they can go and say, hey, this is a thing that we need to roll out enterprise-wide or this is, this is why we're focusing on the customer experience today versus, you know, what we've been doing for the last X number of years. So I think, that's, I think those are two, two big things there. Yeah, I think that uh, you make a great point there, Annette. I think the the impact on employees, what, what is the impact on employees? I mean, is it, are we, do we have processes that are incredibly difficult and frustrating for employees to actually execute yep. them? 
um, which makes their job tough and also they're not able to execute a great experience for the customer. So it's 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 affecting customers and it's affecting employees. So, you know, there's an employee turnover element involved there that, you know, there's an ROI around that that you can measure around what does it cost to, to actually yep. hire and replace people. So there's a couple of, couple of angles to, to look at it. Um, that's, uh, that's a good point. So companies that are really just at the start of this and they're thinking about, you know, customer centricity, that, you know, customer experience is everywhere now. I mean, we've, we're seeing that as being a, a key issue um, across industries. Um, and so some companies are just sort of at the beginning of this. And a lot of this is being driven by, uh, in my view, sort of primarily the competitive landscape. I think there's a, a a dramatic um, continuation of the trend to be more competitive, right? So I think more industries are facing more competition, um, and and that's really a driver that I see for for companies looking at customer centricity and saying, well, is there a way for us to benefit by actually focusing a bit more energy and resource on the customer? Um, what, what are your thoughts in terms of the, the starting place? I think. I think there's there's an important thing that we have to talk about here, and that is, you know, what are the pain points or what are the problems that the business is trying to solve when, when they're whatever whatever the initiative is that you know the project that they want to the change that they want to make, and I'm not talking about the you know the entire transformation, and I'm not talking about the culture, but I'm talking here about you know you've you've identified some issue. Um, or you've said, hey, I'm the CEO or I'm the CMO or whoever I am, somebody in the C-suite said, hey, we've got to change our culture. We've got to change the way that we do things. We've got to put, you know, um, the customer front and center. Why do we need to go do this? Well, I think that one of the things that we always have to look for or, and look at is what are the pain points or the problems that we're trying to solve? And, you know, anytime I first start with a client and they come to me, it's like, well, what, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? What is it? What's the reason that suddenly you want to make this change? And, you know, somebody says, well, everybody else is doing it, so we ought to be doing it. You know, there, there's a problem there. They really haven't thought about, you know, what this means for the business and why they're going to undertake this major transformation that's going to take many years to, to accomplish, right? So I, I think we, we have to to sort of go back to the basics and say, what are the pain points? What problems are you trying to solve? And then ultimately, you know, they've got to link everything to outcomes. What is what does that mean for the business? If we start doing things differently, what will that mean for the business? And like I said, I think they have to use the calculation or the or the approach to, you know, how does it impact the employee and the employee experience? How will that ultimately impact the customer and the customer experience? What are the metrics and then what are the impacted and then what are the desired outcomes? So uh, my, my short answer is identify the pain points and the problems you're trying to solve within your organization and then from there go on to the next step. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I think some people just hear that others are doing this or, you know, somebody's got somebody's ear and then they start diving into this work without really taking the time to understand the why behind what they're doing. So. Yeah, 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 yeah no, exactly. So, you know, I think we've got a, a fairly specific take on this. Um, and, you know, it, it's related to what you're saying, uh, Annette, and, you know, for us, the idea is to really start by by getting a sense of really where are we as an organisation on a continuum of being customer centric. So, you know, from being you know highly customer centric to being um, sort of on the lower scale of being customer centric. We've got a tool that measures that and it also allows you to look at how does that relate to different business performance outcomes that you can see here. But I think a big benefit is that you just get to see. Um, where are we? And then also out of this comes a lot of that, some of those um, challenges that people in the business are experiencing. So there's a way to get verbatim comments out of this to hear from people that are saying, hey, this is, this is what is a real issue for us when it comes to trying to deliver a better experience for our customers. And, and you can kind of categorise a couple of those key pain points and it becomes very clear that you know, what to do as an organisation once you've got that data because it, it gives you a feeling for the people that are in the business that are executing on this and are, are trying to deliver a, a great experience. They're, they're telling you what is it that, that needs to be fixed and, and where to start. Uh, and some of those things might be quick fixes and some of those things can take, 
you know, obviously um, several years, depending on the complexity of what what needs to be done to to kind of advance the organisation. Um, but but we would advocate for you know start with measurements, start with where are we, um, and then you can make some decisions on where to go from there. Um, I love but, the MRI. It's a great it's a great it's a great tool that you guys have. It's a yeah, I think it, it's a useful way to just to to try and create um, understanding of where where you are and, and reduce the complexity of, of you know this whole area. So, yep, yep. This is a, another interesting question from the team here. Is there a case for looking at it from a, a different perspective? For example, what would the cost be for not investing in customer centricity programs? You want to, you want to take that one first, Annette? I, I think there's a simple answer to this. And the answer is yes. <laughs> no. I think that any time that you're you're looking at change, change management, whatever you're trying to do, right? We always have to look at what's what's the benefit of doing this, and what's what and what happens if we change, and what happens if we don't change, and then weigh the pros and cons, right? Weigh the which, where, where does the balance lean toward? If we don't do this. Ultimately, we will die. You know, the business will will falter. You know, whatever it is. But I, I, I like I said, I think there's a really simple answer to this. That yes, absolutely. Every time you try to build a business case, or every time you're trying to um, show ROI for what needs to be done, you've absolutely got. Because you know what? If this is if this is something that you're taking to the C-suite to say, hey, we should we should be doing this. If they're if they're thinking the way that they ought to be thinking, they ought to be think they probably are. Well, what if we don't do it? What's what's the outcome if we don't do it? So yeah, I, I absolutely think this is a, a smart way to do your due diligence. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's an interesting way to think about it. I, I, I think that that um, if you there's a great term that Jeff Bezos from Amazon uses, which is that customers have this sort of divine discontent. Which is this idea mm -hmm. that the customers uh, and their expectations and what they want um, from an experience point of view is always evolving, right? And it's always changing. So right. if you're not keeping on top of that um, and your competitors are keeping on top of that, you're going to fall behind. So that's the real risk factor that that I see in in competitive environments. Now, can you get away with not investing in it? Um, certainly in monopolistic environments environments where you don't have, customers don't have alternatives um, you can see where those you know companies can uh, do do less when it comes to, to being customer centric um, over time those industries are sort of opening up and we're seeing that now um, and so the, the question then becomes you know how long can we continue to to, to not pay attention to this and uh, you know for most industries you know, there's, there's not a lot of time um, yeah I think the other thing that's interesting, I mean, just to go back to the MRI just quickly here, this this tool that measures customer centricity. You know, we've found also, you know, from a from a an employee engagement point of view, uh, people like working for companies that are delivering great experiences for customers. They want to be part of a company that, that really like, you know, does that. And if you think about these two companies here. These are actual results from companies. The one on the left is really a very customer-centric organisation. The one on the right is, uh, you know, not so customer-centric. And for most people, you know, who would you want to work for? And I think most people would say, I want to work for someone that's delivering a, a great experience. I want to work for a, a company like, like Apple or, um, or, or, you know, Starbucks or a company that really delivers a great experience consistently to their customers and, you know, it's a brand that you can be proud of. So... I think that's the other piece of this too. Yeah, I, I would agree. I have a slide. It's obviously not this same slide, but I have a slide that has two pyramids on it, two culture pyramids, right? Uh, the one on the, I'm closing my eyes and visualizing it right now. The one on the right is what I call the traditional organization culture, right? It has the foundation is mission, vision, values. Maybe they're socialized, maybe probably not operationalized, I don't know, but pretty weak. But the next thing up on the on the foundation is, um, and the next area of focus is revenue and profitability, and then customers, and then at the top of the pyramid is employees. Maybe there's, or there's very rarely a focus on employees in those companies. 
and then on the on the, in the other pyramid is what I call the people centric um, pyramid, right, or the people centric culture, where the foundation is mission, vision, values, and purpose, and mm-hmm. those are socialized and operationalized. The next layer is leadership alignment around what we need to do here, you know, leadership alignment around having a customer-centric culture and putting people first. And so the next layer is then the employee experience. The next area focuses on customer experience and at the top of that pyramid is revenue and profitability. And really the, the net net of that one is, right, people put the people first and the numbers will come. And I know the work that, that you do is exactly that, right? This is yep. sort of mirrors what, uh, what you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a great roadmap, actually, and it is one of the, the pieces that you need to get in place to, to make this successful in an organisation and, yeah. and build, that, build that foundation. Yeah, that's great. Yep, yep. So we've also got to... The last question here that we've got is, you know, do we have examples of, of companies um, that have been able to do yeah. this that, that can really build this capability? And, it, it, you know, it's not an easy capability if it's not built into the DNA, right? We talk about these great companies like Apple and, and Amazon and others that really have it built into their DNA, but what about those companies that are trying to build it? You know, how do they, how do they take this on? Um, and I've got a couple of specific examples um, that, that I can share. Maybe I'll share this first one and then, Annette, if you've got some some examples you, you want to talk about also. Um, yeah, this absolutely. Is, absolutely. Yeah, so this, this, is, this is one from a company called Telstra. So Telstra is the AT&T of uh, Australia. So it's the largest telecommunications firm down there. And they had a great CEO for a number of years. It's a guy called David Thode, um, was was the CEO for about five and a half years. And he really was determined to build a customer-centric culture in what was um, uh, ostensibly a government department for many, many years and was a monopoly government um, provider and then became privatised over a period of time. And but really had a reputation of bureaucracy and, and slow moving and, and not a great experience. But part of his challenge was to, you know, to really create a customer centric organization was, you know, he needed to go to the board and say, well, if we're going to invest money in this, what's really the return? And, and one of the ways that they did that was they looked at sort of some of the key moments of truth, which really um, resulted in, in customers either staying with Telstra or abandoning Telstra and going somewhere else. And one of those moments of truth was this movement um, of a customer from a house or, or a business premises. So they've gone from one location to another and they want to take their, um, you know, their, their IT and their, in particular their internet services across. And at the start of this program, they had an NPS, a net promoter score, who I'm sure everyone on the call has heard, heard of that, that metric, and a net promoter score was minus 60. So had many, many more, um, yeah, many, many more unhappy customers than they did um, advocates. And what, what's interesting is, you know, so minus 60 was a really, you know, negative score at the beginning. They, they spent a number of years trying to transfer culture, process, and some technology things. Um, and they were able to move it. It doesn't sound that great, but it's a great result given where they came from. They were able to go from negative 60 to zero so so you know that's where you've got just as many advocates as you do uh, have detractors but this had a substantial bottom line impact for for, for Telstra I mean they measured this at more than a hundred million dollars in revenue um, over that period of time so that was just one uh, significant touch point that that I identified that, that that really affected the churn whether or not customers would continue to do business with them or not and so they were able to connect the net promoter score to really, you know, a, a revenue number to say, look, if we move this, what's the effect? And so they're able to come up with a, um, a good case to go to the board and say, look, you know, we, we need $20 million to invest in changing this, this, this touch point and uh, we know that we'll get a return over time and they did. So that's a, a, an example. It's kind of a specific one for a telco and a specific sort of moment of truth. Um, Annette, do you, do you have one that comes to mind that's um, similar? Yeah, I've actually got I've actually got 
five examples. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we'll have time to go through all five, but, but the thing that I wanted to just say is, you know, when we think about great cultures and, and brands with great cultures, um, we think about, you know, the usual suspects, right, like Zappos and Southwest and Ritz-Carlton. And, and these are, a lot of these are, most of the time we think about B2C brands, and I do have some B2B examples, and I thought these would be really um, fun to share. Um, the first one is uh, um, WD40. Do you know Gary Ridge, their CEO? Yes. Yeah, he's an Australian. Yep. Great. Yes, I figured you. <laughs> I figured you might know him. Um, I, I, um, I've been following him for some time now, and I love to listen to him speak. I love when he talks about, you know, um, his tribe. He talks about the culture and the amazing things that they've done. And um, yeah, the, that is that is. Um, I think what they're what they really focus on is um, a culture of learning and, yeah. and really living their core values. So that's a that's a cool one. Um, another one. This one's definitely uh, B two B. W L Gore. They're very well known for. Um, they're the manufacturer of Gore Tex and a ton of other things, right? But that's what they're known for. But they are very well known for their culture. And one of the one of the things that they've seen since 1998 is a listing in Forbes. 100 best companies to work for. So that's a pretty cool um, achievement. Since 1998, that's 20, you know, 22 years. So, and they've got um, their turnover is 3%. 3% turnover is uh, pretty unheard of in most industries, right? Yeah. Um, another example is a company called Barry Way Miller. They're based out of um, St. Louis. And uh, they have an amazing CEO, Bob Chapman, who had this epiphany years ago about how we ha have to really take care of our people. And his focus has really been around building a culture of, you know, caring. Uh, and he's got um, this concept that he calls truly human leadership. And it, and it shows, you know, they're a four-plus billion dollar company, massive company grown through acquisitions and everything. But, um, but uh, he's out there evangelizing every day for this type of leadership and this type of culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, the fourth one is Atlassian. Uh, do you know them? Yeah. They're an Australian company, actually. They, um, are, they have what they. Example. Yeah. I'm sorry, you cut out there. What was that? The, I, I think they're a great example. I mean, I, I actually went to university with the two guys that founded uh, Atlassian. So, uh, yeah, they've done very well. Did you really? Oh, That's awesome. A talk, talk a little bit about that because they are, they've got like a $50 billion market cap, but they, their focus is like an open, no bullshit culture. And who wouldn't love that, right? So what, what do you know about those guys and how they started at Blasian? Yeah. So, uh, you know, they, they were both at uh, the University of New South Wales in Sydney and um, they were studying um, uh, technology, essentially. I was there doing business, so doing technology. And, you know, they, they really... The, the goal for those guys was actually they didn't ever really want to wear a suit and tie. So that was the kind of <laughs> behind, behind uh, trying I to build love it. where they didn't want to wear a suit and tie. And um, they're both very down-to-earth Australian guys. Um, you know, the, the, they started really with building collaboration software for IT professionals. So this allows IT people to share their software code in a really efficient way. Yep and build great software so that was kind of the foundation of right. the business um but they've, they've built an incredible culture uh they're both very sort of uh humble um you know authentic guys and and uh you know it's a great example of a company that's really living its values and and, and being very very yep. successful uh, at the same time yeah yeah awesome um, so all that to say you know it's not just a b2c thing it is a b2b thing too and it's possible mm -hmm. and and a lot yeah. of times, and I, I love your thoughts on this, because a lot of times, and I know it's hard to, you know, if you're in a 50-year-old company, right, to, to shift the culture. You've seen it. You've worked with clients where you've done that. Mm -hmm. But these guys, they started it from scratch, right? I mean, this is a, this is a company. I don't, I don't remember how old they are, but they're maybe less than 20 years, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they built that into their culture from the get-go. So what are your yeah. thoughts on that, like the difference? Yeah, look, I, you know, I think, you know, it's the difference between being born as a more customer-centric organisation and then and then having to re-sort re of energise that. And I think many companies start, well, most companies, I would say, start that way. I think 
when you don't pay attention to culture as you grow and scale, uh, I think that's where a business can lose sight of what what its founding principles were. Um, so right. you know, part of the challenge is is you know the the, the founders um, have a huge influence on the culture, and certainly um, you know the way that 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 sort of evolves over time. And sometimes they pay attention to it, sometimes they don't. And if they don't, then that's where it can go sort of the, in my view, the wrong way. I think what's really interesting is, you know, many people were saying Apple was really not going to do well once Steve Jobs left. And I think one of the brilliant things about what Steve Jobs did there was he did instill a very, very strong culture around innovation, uh, customers, right. uh, customer experience, the product, um, those and really excellence, right, in, in all of those things. Yep. And and that's sustained. I mean, I think it'd be hard to argue that that, that doesn't still exist um, under Tim Cook's leadership, who is a very different type of leader, but it shows the power of yeah. intentional focus on that. And I think Steve Jobs did a great job of that when he came back to Apple. I don't think he necessarily had that insight when he was younger and, uh, you know, was ultimately removed from the company. Um, but you can see that in action there. Um, but, you know, the, the, so to go back to the challenge, okay, so we don't, we, we're not all working for Apple or these other organisations. I think Telstra is a great example of the fact that it is possible. It is possible to change how people um, think about the organisation they work for and the work that they're doing and, and really putting customers at the centre. It's not an easy change to, to, to engage in, but it's certainly something that can be done and will result in better business performance, um, particularly in a competitive market environment, right? So you, you're really trying to be more customer-centric than your nearest competitor um, and, and understand your customers better than they do and be able to execute better than they do um, when it comes to experience. So I think that's that's yep. really the key. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. Do you have any other examples? I know I kind of threw yeah. a bunch of them out there, but do you have any other examples? Yeah, no, I've got one other that I was going to bring up on the screen here, um, which is kind of a – I brought this in because it's quite a quite a different one. It, it, Westpac is a, is a bank in Australia that um, – one of the large banks, so it's probably equivalent to, um, you know, Wells Fargo in the US. Um, and they have, um, we did some work with a, a group within the bank, which was actually the collections department. So this was the group that's responsible for late payments and essentially taking people's homes off them if they can't pay. So it's a pretty challenging department to work in. Um, and, you know, they were interested in the idea of customer centricity. How does that apply to us at Westpac? And, you know, we're a functional group here and we, we basically need to, to get money back from, from clients that aren't paying. And we spent some time with them in a series of workshops and, you know, we got them to, to, to start to think a little bit differently about what the, what the work of the collections department was. And, and we helped them sort of change a mindset from sort of this idea of we, we're collecting money for the bank to, you know, we're helping customers with their mortgage payments and proactively seeking to advise customers on their money management so that they can keep their assets. So it's kind of a, a shift from, you know, we're just getting the money back that, that the customers owe us to how do we help them be successful by retaining their asset and continuing to pay the interest and, and, and so on on that asset. And, you know, just a shift in mindset, um, you know, that they started to think about themselves instead of the collections department, think of themselves as the customer retention department, right? So how do we retain these customers? It's better for the bank if these customers yep. keep paying their bills. It's not actually that great for the bank to get the asset back and then have to sell it for a loss and things like that. So, right. you know, there's actually not a, a win-win there. There's a lose-lose. So how do we shift it to a win-win sort of mindset? And you know, that they had tremendous results in this instance. You know, they were able to increase their, their collection rates by 3%, which was, you know, more than half a million dollars in a six-month period. So just, you know, thinking differently about the work that you're doing can have a big impact on the results of that work. And, and I'd argue that just applying the customer-centric mindset, the way of thinking about it, 
how do we actually think differently about the work that we're doing so that we're we're helping customers succeed and we're also helping obviously the organization succeed and that's that's a powerful shift that's a, that's an interesting story absolutely i love that yeah. what a shift in the mindset and and everything there that's excellent yeah yeah no real difference um so the, the last sort of slide that I, I wanted to share and, and sort of talk with you about, Annette, was, was really this, there's kind of two ways to look at it. You know, you can look at customers as, okay, that's a, that's an, uh, a, a customer and someone that I need to get money from, right? I need to extract value from. Um, and that's, a, again, it's kind of an internal way of looking at things. Or, or you can say, well, how do we actually um, get value together? And, and so I think this idea of shifting from value extraction to, to value uh, sort of co-creation um, is, is a great idea. I came across this, um, just to acknowledge the source here, Michael Schran is a, uh, an MIT um, uh, Sloan School research fellow, and he, he wrote a great article in HBR about this. But thinking about, you know, there are different ways of thinking about the value of customers. It's not just the financials. Uh, obviously, if they buy more and they uh, and so on, there, there are financial implications to that. But there's also other value that can be derived from customers. You know, when they give us good ideas, um, when they evangelize for us on social media, when they collaborate with us, when they try some of our new products, right? We've got a new product. We don't know how it's going to go. We've got to put it out in the marketplace. We've got a good relationship with customers. We can do that. Um, when they introduce us to their customers, um, or when they refer us, and, and when they share data with us, I thought it was a good way of thinking about it. So beyond just the financial impact, what are the other ways in which we can get impact from um, working with customers uh, and getting value? I like that. I like that shift in thinking there, inside out versus outside in, right? Yeah, so I think that's that's really what we're advocating here, and I think there's there's a way to do it um, that is a is a way that that is more competitive, um, that delivers better outcomes for the customer, the business, for employees, um, and it, it just takes a shift in mindset, a way of thinking about what we're doing, uh, so that we can we can actually get those results. So that was kind of everything that we had sort of prepared to talk about, I think, Annette, and um, I'm not sure yep. if there's any questions um, from people, um, but if there are, we can take those. But was there anything else that we haven't sort of covered that I think is part of this topic area, Annette? I, I think we've covered quite a bit. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's good. I love it. This is a great topic. Yeah, it is. It is a great topic. It is a great topic. All right, so I think the last slide we've got here is, um, you know, this has been part of a, a webinar series and there's another webinar coming up, looks like tomorrow and then uh, Thursday, Friday this week uh, as part of this series. So um, I encourage everyone that's listening to uh, to sign up for those um, and hear more. And uh, you can reach out to, to me at Market Culture um, we have uh, some great resources on our website. We have some e-learning resources, some free resources. So I'm happy to, to, to share those with you. And uh, Annette, where can they find you? Yeah, they can find me at uh, cx-journey.com. I'm happy to, happy to share my thoughts, share my ideas, share resources as well. So uh, absolutely. But yeah, um, you can find me through my website and my contact information is there as well. And I just mm -hmm. want to make a note here that even though this is the North American Customer Centricity Awards and we've got, you know, North America here, we've got South America as well. I just want to say, I think we covered Australia as well today. So <laughs> we, did. <laughs> we did indeed. And, uh, and you've got a new book also, <laughs> I should mention. Um, t tell us a bit about that. That's just come out recently. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I appreciate that. It came out in uh, September. Um, customer understanding: three ways to put the customer in the, you know, in, in the customer experience and at the heart of your business. And it's, um, it, it's very relevant to what we just talked about here today, right? It's I, yeah. I always say customer understanding is the cornerstone of customer centricity, right? Because it's all about bringing the 
customer voice and bringing the customer into your business and into your discussions and into your designs and everything. So, yeah, so very relevant to our conversation today. So thank you. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look that up, everyone. All right. Well, um, great to talk with you as always, Annette. And um, I'm, Likewise. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to our next conversation. I think we've, we can, uh, we could probably wrap up now, um, given our. Yep. Doesn't look like there's any questions. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, but um, thanks for your time and uh, look forward to chatting again in the future. Yeah, thank you as well. This was wonderful. Thank you and uh, talk to you again soon. All right. Bye now.